Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to discuss few aspects of the theory of markedness. Here are some background assumptions. Let us have a look on them. The first assumption is that universal principles can be universal only if they are actually inviolate in every language which induces us to interpret universality from a different point of view. That means inviolate means cannot be violated in any condition by any language. So this gives us the impression that those conditions cannot be violated and that is why they are universal in nature in every language. They are present and universally present in every language. It also leads to a sharp increase in the abstractness of both linguistic representations and rule interactions. When some universal principle is violated in the output of the grammar, then the characteristic way of explaining this was to set up an intermediate level of representation at which it is actually satisfied. So by this point, what we actually try to convey is that some principles are universally in nature but those can be violated in the output then those characteristics actually explain to set up the intermediate level of representation that means there is something else at the intermediate level intermediate level that means which is between the input to output mapping Next, we have few more ideas and assumptions about universality. The first one is that the absolute interpretation of universality is not the only one possible. So absolute interpretation cannot be true or cannot be valid. There may be some exceptions. There may be some conditions where even the universal nature or condition are viable in certain languages, in certain form, and so on. So there exist some gaps or there exist some exceptions to universality also. In structuralist linguistics and also in generative phonology, then comes natural phonology. All these form forms of linguistics and some of them also have some uh, assumptions regarding phonology. So this notion of markedness plays a key role. We have this particular uh, work by Louis Helmslev. He's a Russian fellow and he wrote originally this particular book, which was uh, it was uh, published in 1935, as you can see here, but uh, translated and reissued in 1972. So this is a structuralist uh, book of linguistics. Then we have the famous author of structuralist linguist who published a day. He is called Nikolai S. Trubetskoy. He is another Russian who published in 1939. And the English translation was published in 1969, 30 years later. And the translation, translated version was called Principles of Phonology. So this book also gives us background of structuralist linguistics, not only phonology or phonetics. These books or these works have voluminously talked about the structuralist interpretations. So these two names are important. Along with Roman Jakobson, please remember the pronunciation is not Jacobson, but it's Jakobson. It's a Roman name again. And both all of these actually belong to the Prague School of Linguistics, who propounded the theory of structuralism in linguistics. So Jakobson, Jakobson's work was published first in 1941 and uh, almost 21 years later, it was selected and, uh, you know, uh, published as selected writings by uh, the German publisher, the Hogg in Mutton. 
this is Amal City. So this book along with the other two, uh, all of these are works in structuralist linguistics. So if possible, please try to remember these three names. Then all of these actually appeared and Stephen R. Anderson in 1985 have, uh, you know, uh, summarized the main findings and he had given a very good brief account of phonology in the 28th century, theories of rules and theories of representations. This was published by University of Chicago Press. And Anderson actually, his work was not very fundamental, but he summarized all of them, uh, all the three uh, previous works in structuralism, and then gave it a very, you know, a nice reading towards structuralism. So if you cannot go get hold of the previous works and you cannot, you know, uh, decode what uh, Hemslev or Trubetskoy or Jakobson were saying, you can have a good reading by Anderson's a book in 1985. There are many editions later. Uh, similarly, we have Noam Somsky and Maurice Halle, who in 1968 propounded the theory of generative linguistics or generative phonology, particularly. They have published the sound patterns of English, and that is the book or that is the work uh, which uh, actually initiated the generative framework of linguistics. So please remember this name, the author's title, and the year of publication. So it's um, mostly said Somsky and Halle, 1968. Then uh, Keane's book, Mary Louise Keane, she also talked about the theory of markedness in generative grammar. So you can see the transition from 1968 when Maurice Halle and Noam Somsky have talked about the sound patterns of English. So what happens with the sounds of English and many languages? Basically, they talked about English. So from then, the generative trend began. And then Mary Louis and many other authors have taken the generative framework into account. And then they have developed their own assumptions into different theories, including the marketness distinction. So uh, please note this. Uh, the first one is 1968 when generative phonology began, and uh, other works then followed. Similarly, Paul Kiparsky's 1985, Some Consequences of Lexical Phonology. So, Kiparsky's um, uh, work, which was published in Phonology Yearbook, uh, it's, it's a journal actually. So, this is a paper by Kiparsky. And uh, it was published in 1985, so almost 10 years later, after Keane's publication. And this also talked about marketness, but through, all, through the light of a new theory that is called lexical phonology. So what happens with the words, that means lexemes, and how they are, uh, they in, incorporate phonological distinctions. Or in the other way around, okay, how, how phonological aspects are incorporated in the lexical level of linguistics. So Kiparsky's work talked about that thing. Uh, then coming to natural phonology, we have uh, David Stum, or many people say it's Stumpe. Now he published uh, an, another uh, PhD dissertation. He worked on this and the name is very interesting, how I spent my summer vacation. And in that, he had uh, propounded this theory called natural phonology. But natural phonology is a branch or an offshoot of generative framework only. So uh, this, has, this also had taken some bits and parts of generativeness and then uh, you know, gave it a new turn and gave it a na new name also, saying natural phonology. His was the first uh, work on natural phonology and then comes hooper by b hooper john by b hooper uh, in 1976 four years later uh, he adopted that uh, theory by stump and he gave, gave us an introduction to natural generative phonology so as i said natural phonology is uh, somehow related to generative phonology itself and uh, it 
it, it uh, has a few assumptions of generative framework. So these are the works by many authors and all of them actually talk about something related to marketness. And what is marketness? As we have some idea, some basic idea of marketness already, we know that this particular term marketness gives us a, a, us a feeling that something is marked as the other opposition is not marked. That means marked means the most more complex structure and unmarked means the simpler structure. So that uh, notion of marketness is or has been inculcated in all those frameworks like structuralist linguistics, then uh, generative phonology and natural phonology and which was uh, later on uh, said to be natural generative phonology. In all of those theories, the theory or the notion of marketness plays a key role which basically embodies universality in a soft sense. So that's all for today. In the next video, we will be talking more about marketness. So this was just the background of the theory. Thank you very much.